Hey there. Today I continue my journey through the different threat levels, as this week I am joined by Will from House Party Protocol to talk about where we land on 20 different five threat characters, and that it does include those four threats that like to get gemmed up. But before I get to our rankings, there are two things that I like to address. First is how we are using the S2D scaling system. Uh, for me, S-tiers are characters that are too good. Characters that likely need to be toned down in some way or another for the health of the game. A-tier characters are the ones that are strong enough to be easily splashed or always see play in their affiliated homes, but don't really need to see any balance changes. B-tier are solid characters that will see affiliated play, or can see some splash play where there are really nice synergies with particular leadership abilities, but really characters in this range are also in a good spot and don't need any, need any changes, in my opinion at least. The C tier is for characters who have reasonable play in one spot because of a very specific role or job or they're affiliated. Really characters here probably just need like one minor tweak to be brought up into the ranks of an A or a B, minor in the sense of Iron Man's Repulsor Blast only costing two instead of three power. Then D tier is for characters that don't see the table that often, and are most often seen for narrative styled games or maybe a meme list. Now that said, the gap from A to D isn't a crazy gap, and a character that we list at D can absolutely come into a game and do as much if not more work than an A tier character, but they probably aren't doing that as consistently as an A tier does. I wouldn't mind seeing these characters put into the D tier, get a couple of tune-ups to have an argument to see the table a little bit more often. Uh, the second thing I do want to address is that yes, I know that tier lists are not everybody's favorite form of content. They don't require a lot of time on my end of setup, filming, or editing, and they're really just full of opinions that you by no means need to agree with. They're very simple to do, they show no creativity, and all that kind of stuff, but Hear me out, these are a great reason to bring in other great community members to get their thoughts on different characters' values, but they're also just really fun to make. The last three of these that I've done, after we were done recording and stuff, the first thing that my guest usually says is like, man, that was just kind of fun. And they are. Uh, and also they are easy to produce when also editing podcasts and other videos that come out weekly. Uh, I will also say these are divisive, and are pretty consistently some of the most popular content though in the gaming world. So if this isn't for you, I 100% understand. Leave a comment down below about what kind of content you are looking for, and I can either point you towards some of my other videos or podcasts that fit the niche, or I can point you towards somebody else in the community who covers what you were looking for, because we have a fantastic community here. But please be respectful, because even if it isn't for you, at least recognize that there are at least a couple thousand of people who do enjoy these. So with that said, my name is Nate, and welcome to the Gamers Guild. Alrighty guys, I am here with, I dare say, my good friend Will from House Party Protocol, who's kind of been in it with me since the beginning of MCP. How are you doing, man? You know, I'm chilling, and uh, yeah, you're kind of, it is odd that, yeah, it has kind of been since the beginning. We, we've been here, just hanging on. I remember you went up to Gen Con and snaked a bunch of pictures and information for us for some early episodes. Uh, yes, and that is it all began there. Uh, you, me, and some guy from uh, the other side of Tennessee were all in like a little chat talking about like what we're going to try to do. And ah, uh, man, that, that's a throwback. It is, isn't it? Uh, and here we are now with not the one five threat that the game started with, but 20 of them. Uh, and just lots to talk about here. I will say. Uh, in the last couple of videos with the threes and the fours, like those are some very splashable characters. Those are characters that we have both like plenty of, uh, but as we get into these higher numbers, we're, you're less likely to see characters splashed into other places consistently. So there's probably not going to be as many A's as we have seen elsewhere. If you think that's fair. Oh, I 
definitely think that's fair. I mean, there's also less of a pool as you get to the higher threat values. So the little differences between certain characters really tend to stand out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, So we've got 20 all in all, including the gym bearers who can bump themselves up to five threat. Uh, And we're going to start where it all began with MODOK. I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of like C plus B minus for our big headed friend. What about you? So I think he is pretty solidly a B like he's not a B plus, not a B minus. And I think it's interesting that you put him on that potential C tier because I still think that he's one of those characters that is really strong, plays a really good role on the tabletop can be played out of affiliation, but definitely loves playing with his cabal mates, his cabalers, if you will, especially some of the new ones. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I feel like that he, he has a really nice synergy, especially, again, with the new cabal leader that we just got because of the healing, the movement. Like One of the biggest problems that MODOK had back in the day was his susceptibility to control, specifically people like Shuri, who had size unrestricted range five pushes. Mm -hmm. But that's not really as much of a thing anymore. And I feel like that people are sleeping a little bit on on the big head's big impact he can have. Yeah, the canceling wilds is still super impactful, as I have recently experienced, unfortunately, for myself, trying to kill him. Uh... But yeah, Mo- Modoc's still really good. He's a little less mobile than I would like, and I wish that his uh, re-roll, instead of just limiting it to once per turn, I think it just needed to... I don't know. I wish that something could... I'm just going to restart that. Uh... Yeah, I he he's just not as mobile as I kind of would like to. I have also not played much of Kitty Cat Cabal, so I can't speak too much to uh, how Modoc plays there. I'll take your word though, since uh, I know you've got a couple locals who are uh, big Kitty Cat fans. Oh yeah, and we'll we'll, we'll leave him in at the uh, the B. And yeah, he he doesn't really need anything to give him mobility because then he uh, he skyrockets into super nasty range and stuff, and he still has plenty of nice features. Maybe him throwing size four terrain wouldn't have been an awful thing. I don't know. I could see that. And one little final tangent here is when you mentioned his reroll ability and stuff like that. Like I, I agree with you. It's one of those things where I think Modok was one of those characters that was such a big bad in MCP for a while. I mean, he really was. And, and you know, Bow to the Will of Modoc, admittedly, way too strong. A couple things, way too strong. But, like, he was such a big bad of MCP that I think he got hit with the, the little let's go maybe slightly further in mm-hmm. that tuned down direction. And I, I think that the, the re-roll part of it is, is really where it hit him hard. But I still think he is, he is very, very good and there aren't too many things that are going to be displacing him in the game really. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, We then have Thor. Uh, I'm going to put him in C. I I think Thor needs a little bit of help. And in the sense that like Thor on the table can either be your absolute best piece without a doubt or he can just be an absolute dud who maybe gets to uh, use his superpower throw, and that's like all the consistency that he brings. You know, I have to completely agree with you. I, I think that Thor is like C minus territory almost in his leadership is really good, and mm-hmm. playing with Asgard and all of that, and like like you said, when Thor's flowing, when the hammers are throwing, I mean. He feels really good, and he's one of those characters that if the dice fail you and you have no way to manipulate them, then it's it's a struggle. Mm-hmm. And he has no defensive abilities, so if 
he's a character that he has to be up in the action. And if you are up in that action and you don't get what you need from his offensive abilities, he just kind of crumples. Mm-hmm. And it's, that's kind of sad. Yeah, I'm not sure, like, because I don't think he needs a major tune-up. I don't think he needs, like, a, a big overhaul. Uh, invulnerability uh, damage reduction would go a long way on him. And honestly, just changing uh, his throw trigger on his strike from a wild to a hit mm. could be just, like, give it give it a little bit of a, a numbers boost on getting that throw off because six dice with no consistency help behind them isn't that terrifying. Like it's good. The spikes are there, but yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I feel like Thor, I think there's a a few things that need to change to make that consistency throw on his strike would be, would be nice. I I think that'd be great. But for me, it's more about his staying power on the tabletop. Mm -hmm. He needs some stamina or some, like you said, invulnerability, something to just keep him alive. That little, bit longer because over time you throw enough dice things happen right and when i when i look at thor like it's it's if he can get to the point where he's throwing enough dice good things should happen and then i also feel like things like for asgard you know for asgard is really strong but it also feels like you're paying that extra power and it's literally they were just like you know what we want to make you work for getting this turn one instead of just letting you have it turn one Mm -hmm. and so i feel like that maybe some tuning there could be interesting and you know otherwise it's just it's just he just kind of said ever ever so slightly downgrade there you know yep absolutely just just needs a slight tune up yep uh and next up is his adopted brother and I want to hear your thoughts first. Uh, I'm, I'm looking specifically at Mind Gym Loki. Space Gym Loki is a thing, but with it being restricted, I think if you're going to throw a gem on Loki at this point, it's probably Mind Gym. Absolutely. And Loki, I feel like, oh man, he's one of the hardest characters to play in the game. It, like, play well in the mm-hmm. game, I feel like. And, and I think that that puts him in B plus A minus territory. Because I feel like with Mind Gem Loki specifically, the amount of control he has, plus the quote unquote Loki bubble of making people have to spend more power for their active and reactive superpowers, really can pay immense dividends as a splashable character. But Loki is is not one to be splashed lightly. I feel mm-hmm. like you have to know what you're doing, know his ranges, know his um, timings, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So for me, he's firm B, B plus, maybe even A minus, because I think that he is, he's one of the strongest kind of nuanced characters in the game. Yeah. I'm just going to go ahead and throw him in a tier for myself as somebody who has piloted uh, the absolute heck out of Loki and, knows his value and what he brings both in the annoyance factor of your, like he doesn't see the table that often you should, he should probably see the table more often because every time I bring him to an event or something, or even at the local game night store, I've stopped doing that because he's mean. Uh, But somebody's like, Oh, and now I'm going to do this. And I'm like, Oh, you don't actually have enough power for that though. And it's just the, like that look of like, Oh, this whole plan that I had concocted just fell apart. Uh, so there, there's that factor to him. He's one of the, he's more consistent than Thor on dealing damage with his strike. Thanks to counting blanks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then trickster is again, one of the, one of the trickier parts of piloting Loki. But once you've got trickster down, uh, it can absolutely just, it, it makes Loki very, very hard to kill in addition to being able to count Blanks' successes on defense rolls. Yeah, yeah, and it, he's just, he's a really great character, and I know A tier means that no balance changes really need to be made. However, I will say, I think one stamina bump on either his healthy side or injured side, taking him to six on one or the other, would be the only change I would make to look. Yeah, and he doesn't really need it at the end he of the doesn't. day. 
Uh, next up, we have a guy who's carrying in a restricted gem with him, and that's Corvus. Yep. I think he's A-tier, though. I think he's A-tier, too. Oh, my gosh. Is he A-tier <laughs> on his own? Is he A-tier by himself? With the restricted gem, yes. Or with the reality that is restricted, yes. See, I think that when you talk about Corvus, I know I know his wife is not a five threat, but like part of what makes him so strong is the ability to manipulate that priority between the two of them, right? And so, mm-hmm. so it's kind of like I I can feel the A tier, I feel it, but at the same time, I wouldn't be upset if you put him in the B tier because by himself. If you just splash him as a five threat in and and just off to the races, you have to be more careful with him because he still can go down pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I feel like that he wants to to double tap and fit and then finish somebody off with priority in the next round. So you've got to kind of set that up, right? Yeah. No. And I think. uh I, I see the argument that like without Proxima, he kind of drops, but even uh, like the times that I see Corvus splashed, it is splashed with Proxima as well. Uh, so like, I know uh, there's some n- nasty X-Men uh, combinations that can happen with the two of them for some extract mm-hmm. plays and stuff. Uh, I all, all in all, I think restricting the gem has dropped him from S down to A kind of a, a territory for me. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, and to be fair, he is still one of the most efficient killing machines in the game. And mm-hmm. it, even at five threat with that reality gem, it turns his ability to just delete stuff. It, it happens so fast. <laughs> Yep. Counting you know. blanks. Good. Counting a skull as a crit. Good. Uh, Pierce. Sure. Let's just make it more broken. Uh, he, he kills stuff really, really well. Probably the most efficient character at killing stuff. I would say I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Gemless Ebony Maw. Who I feel like is a, is probably fine at just C. Yeah, yeah. You, you're not always bringing him in affiliation at this point. Mm-hmm. He he does work. Uh, I don't necessarily know if there are any additional changes that need to be made to him, but five is just such a, a that again that weird spot where uh, if you're if you don't have a good place in your home affiliation, you're not often going to be seen. Uh, and I think without the space gym, that's kind of where Ma lands. Yeah, it's interesting, especially when you look at Black Order, right? Like, I don't think of Corvus as a four threat. Mm-hmm. I think of Corvus as a five threat. I don't think of Ebony Ma as a five threat. I think of Ebony Ma as a six threat. The space mm-hmm. gym being restricted, though, definitely is a problem. So that's a that's a that's a problem for six threat tier list, Nate. Yep. Sure and, is. And then when I also think about other five threats in affiliation, I think about another one that we're going to talk about here soon, and that's Black Swan as a five threat. Mm-hmm. So when I look at Ebony Maw in a five threat slot in affiliation, he doesn't really fit there. So you're only going to want to splash him. And he's really susceptible to control elements when he mm-hmm. doesn't have that space gem. Yep. And then when you start to layer in the fact that He's going to go down pretty easy when people start able to pay for his mind over matter, you know, thing. Mm-hmm. So as a five threat, he's a bit of a liability when he doesn't have that space gem. So I think C tier is very fair. Yeah. He's still strong. He's still, he's still going to punch hard. And yeah, if you, you, if you can still him bring him ranges, and be happy with the results that he brings you. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's, he's still going to do a, do a darn good damaging job. Mm hmm. Uh, and then next up, we have the last of our spacey releases for a little bit at least, and that is Ronin with the Power Gem. Ah, uh, yes. Forgot all about Ronin that he could have the Power Gem. <laughs> uh, 
I don't really know. I have not played Power Gym Jim uh, Ronin. I would not recommend playing him that way in Guardians. I know when humans really enjoy having him around with the Power Gym because it just really leans into Black Bolt's leadership. Mm-hmm. But then on the downside, you've got 10 threat and two characters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ronin's an interesting one because he wasn't played for a while and then has become a little bit more popular for certain kitty cat related reasons. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like it was like, you know, he's solid Ronan. Ronan, I think is a solid character, but as a five threat with the power gem, I just don't think it brings enough to his kit. Like you, the idea would be to be able to get a Cree justice off early, but you're not going to get to range two unless someone gets way out of position and you have some crazy control and then you get the Cree justice. But like, I don't feel like that the power gem does anything to boost his kit particularly. Yeah. It ju- it just gives him the power to do the things that he wants to be doing anyway at four threat. Uh, so really, I think really it's just that his, uh, his long range hammer attack needs to become a gainer. Uh, mm-hmm. So I, I think we leave him at C. I, he, he can have some in play with the inhumans and that's like kind of his one niche at five threat, especially right now. But I, I think he just needs that, like a, a small little tune up to uh, get him where he's generating power more efficiently on his own and earlier on his own. And then he'll be fine. Absolutely. Uh, it's perfectly fair. Uh, next up, we have one that is one of your favorites, I believe. Uh, and I'm not sure if this version or the newer version of him is your current favorite, uh, but we have Defender's Leader, Doctor Strange. Ooh, yeah. Defender's Leader, Doctor Strange. All right. Defender's Leader, Doctor Strange, plays a very important role for Convocation and for the Defenders, obviously, leadership in general, right? Mm-hmm. I think he is solidly a B-tier character here. Maybe you could go A tier, but I think that's a little like he's not universal, right? Like Mm -hmm. you're not going to splash him. And like I played him in my web warriors a lot. So there's places he can splash, but he is a great support piece. And if the current, you know, I don't want to say meta, but maybe meta of the game is a lot of attacking and, and stuff like that. Defender strange is really good with, being able to add those extra dice on defense, being able to heal people, being mm-hmm. able to control people with his bolts of bedevilment, having the re-roll from the Eye of Agamotto, gaining a ton of power with the Shield of Seraphim. I, I, I really think that Defender Strange is a, a very good, very strong character, really, but he's not universal, so that's why I think he should be a B-tier. Yeah, I, I agree. I think he has great play in Steve's Avengers, but one of those like who doesn't kind of a thing. And I think there are other five threats that you end up splashing there first. Ala Loki. Uh, Another fun place is with uh, storms X-Men. He can be super annoying and generate tons of power because you always have cover with him outside of being in range two. Thanks to storm that synergizes extremely well with his shields of the Seraphim and other stuff. Uh, so there, there are a couple of fun places, but he is, uh, he's not quite the universal character that, uh, you kind of want to put in, in the A tier. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he's great. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Crimson Bands and how good it feels when you put an activated token on somebody. Yeah, no joke. Uh, next up then is Defender Buddy at five threat, Ghost Rider. You want me to take this one first? Yeah, have at All it. All right. Ghost Rider is firmly in the A tier right now. Really? His, yes. All right. His balance changes. And so he would have been darn near D tier. Probably C tier, but darn near D tier. No, before. I think he got a Hulk sized rework. I think uh, him and Hulk were like the two biggest reworks. Yes, but he he is a character that you can splash him almost anywhere. And feel okay about it. There are places that are better than others. I, I 100% he is a Guardians of the Galaxy player. Like, 
put him in Guardians, you will not be disappointed. Mm-hmm. However, he can pretty much splash anywhere and have an impact on the tabletop one way or another. And with his updated health pool of eight and seven, he can stand there in the middle, take the punishment, and then boop, come back to life with a little deal with the devil. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to deal with him all over again. And that's not to mention his mobility with Hell on Wheels. Unless you have someone that's going to slow him, he is going to get where he wants to go. And he's dice dependent. He has not much defensive tech, but you don't really need the defensive tech when you have a I'm coming back to life card. Yeah, he's he's okay being targeted down. He's okay with your teammates being targeted down because then he can use their own crits to damage the attacker. He gets power for it. Uh, Ghost Rider's in a really good spot. I was going to give him a B plus, A minus, just because he does enjoy being in some of those wider lists like Guardians, like Sam Spam, a little bit more than other teams. But I, I, I respect the A. Yeah, I mean, it's... He's solid. He he is so so good. And 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 what's funny is like I don't feel like he's broken. I feel like he's in a in a really good spot. Mm-hmm. But he's just really good. Yeah. Uh next up we go back to space kind of with Angela, who I think is pretty firmly in the B tier. A A is not for Angela. I have to agree with you. And uh, I, ha- I still have fever dreams about what you did to me with Angela that one time when we were playing Mare Fisk and you got from the leftmost Mare Fisk to the rightmost Mare Fisk in one activation with Angela murdering things along the way. It was awful. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that won you the game. <laughs> that was like the, was that round one of a league or something too? Yeah, I think that was like one of the TTS leagues, like right off the rip. And I was just like, and I'm dead. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Game filled that was with jank. It was a lot of fun, but it was a, that was She Hulk, Scarlet Witch, Angela into Kingpin, whatever else you brought. I don't even remember. Yeah, it was. I was goofing off with Criminal Syndicate, and it did not work out well. But back to there's Angela. a reason you're a you're you're a Convocation man and not a Syndicate man. This is it. This is it. Back to Angela. Why is she a B tier for you, Nate? Uh, For me, I think she plays very solidly in Asgard, even more solidly in A-Force, because my goodness, do she and She-Hulk get along really well. But outside of that, she doesn't really see any play. Uh, And honestly, I would not mind if she got some sort of uh, changes, so I could could almost even see an argument for C-tier, because I feel like her spender needs a little bit of help, or maybe even just her... Uh, builder to give it pierce or something uh, because as it is uh, there's so many times where she just kind of gets roadblocked by a character that has some defensive tech and she can't do anything to them and at five yeah. threat as an assassin kind of character that feels kind of bad yeah and I think I remember saying this about her when she first came out and I think it still rings true she's really good into like the lower threat no defensive mm-hmm. tech type models like like she's going to kill stuff in in those situations but when you're investing that five threat to do that it doesn't always hit the right mark but uh yeah i think she's got some uses like you said but uh this is probably a good spot for her but don't sleep on an angelic assassin it is it can be nasty especially into grunts yep uh, I will say PSA uh, thing that I've already said for X23 and forgot to mention it for Carnage, so I'll say it here. Uh, you cannot build into power to use Angelic Assassin. If you do not have enough power at the start of your attack to use it, if you daze or KO somebody, you get that power, but the timing window doesn't work. So, wait, 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 wait. Hang on. I've, I'm pretty sure somebody did that to me at one point. That's amazing, and I'm glad to know it. So, like, if you don't have the two power when you start your Xyphos attack, and and you get your power, let's say you, you KO a Grunt, and you mm-hmm. get your two power from that, that does not mean you can immediately spend that two power on Angelica. Yes, Sass. because the timing is if this character dazes or KOs an enemy character during its activation, this character may use its superpower. 
and the power gain is after the attack is resolved. So this is like during the attack. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So, just random fun fact. Angela's not one that's usually going to have that problem. She'll have power built up for days anyway. But if you can uh, catch your opponent who might have accidentally thrown something first and then gone for the attack and don't have the power for it, you're welcome. Yeah. Cool. Noted. Fun fact of the day. Next up, we have Black Bolt, who, boy, do I really want to put him in B tier, but I can't bring myself to do it. You said B tier? I I think he belongs in C tier, unfortunately. I really want him to be in B tier because I like his character. I like all the things on his card, but there's still just something that doesn't click with him. And I think he, he needs something to change. I think it's a minor change, whatever it is, but he needs something. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with you. C tier is right where he belongs, unfortunately, uh, mm-hmm. because he's a character I really like. Uh, I, I think he's an interesting character. I think all the things on his kit, make sense but you just never feel like you can use them all Mm -hmm. and and it's like this is one of the few instances of a character where you want this character to get to his injured side like get him to the injured side but then you're playing a really interesting game of chicken yep uh and only having five stamina on his front side kind of leans to that but then you're down on what your potential objective playability is. Uh, and then nine stamina on the backside is just an absurd amount, which is good. He's got nice defenses. His attacks feel good. Honestly, I would not mind if he got the exact same change Iron Man got and just had focus power cost two instead of three. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. And uh, just he just needs that little bit more. Just a mm-hmm. little bit. C tier. Yep. Uh, Next up, we have Amazing Spider-Man. And this is a guy that I feel is uh, pretty nicely in the B tier. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I want want him to be more. (laughs) Because he does good things. But he really is a B tier character. When you think about it, like, solid affiliation play could maybe splash here or there. But realistically, firmly playable within Web Warriors, uh, specifically mm-hmm. Miles' leadership. He brings his own leadership, which is fine and hard to play. But, you know, but he, he's got a, a good kit. And Witty Banter is one of the best superpowers in the game. It's real good. Use so, it more. Yeah. Use it all the time. And he can use it himself. Don't forget mm-hmm. that. Like, I always, always seem to forget so, that. Sounds like somebody has forgotten that a few times, Will. Uh, yeah, I don't know who that would be. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely this guy. But uh, yeah, I, I, he's really good. He's got a long move on the medium base and his web swing can place him within range three. And then he gets to add dice. I mean, he's one of the most mobile characters in the game. Mm-hmm. He's awesome, but he is beat. <laughs> like, he's awesome, but he's a beat. Yep. Uh, yeah, good, good things to say about him. At the end of the day, though, he's not really being splashed anywhere. Doesn't need to be. He, he's just a solid web warrior, and at the end of the day, that's totally fine. Uh, the next character, though, for me, is going to be the first one I put in the D tier, uh, if there is even a second, and that is Cable. What? Uh, that, is this a feigned shock? Because... I think you should totally have seen this coming. Well, I mean, I did kind of see it coming. But why is why is Cable D tier? Like D tier feels akin to F tier if we had such a thing. If we had such a thing. If we look at where Hulk was, where just his kit did not function. Because uh, like Hulk wanted damage and to like get beat up on. He had the 20 health pool, but he had super low defenses. So he was also super fragile. It's like when, when you want to be like, you want to take damage and you're super fragile, there's some synergy there, but it kind of overcorrected and you would just end up killing Hulk going from 10 health to 20 damage uh, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Cable is a character that, 
wants to be at long-ish range so that he can just pick people off with his plasma rifle. But then Mm -hmm. he has mobility to position himself, a throw that's range medium, and then a spender that can heal him, but it's an area two. So he has these like conflicting things of what he wants to do overall, relatively just average defenses. His, his defense line looks like something you would see on your average four threat. Yeah. Oh yeah. His defenses are garbage. And I feel like they swung a little bit in that direction of, Oh, well he, we're going to give him a defensive ability, telekinetic shield. So therefore we can afford to have his defenses lower and, I don't know if that was the logic or not, but that's what it feels mm-hmm. like. Yeah, for sure. And for me, I look cable bro. <laughs> we have a long history. I've played a lot of cable. I love cable for a lot of reasons, but in terms of his kit, not functioning, I think you hit the nail on the head. His spender seven dice area two. And he just gets to take a damage away for each one. But I mean, realistically, you're going to hit two, maybe three people with an area. It costs him six power Mm -hmm. to do. That is, it it is functionally pointless because if you make the steps to get into the range to do it in the first place, like you go out of your way to get there, then you're already back in danger and you're out of power. Well, yeah. And like you, you have a short move. So mm-hmm. you're probably having to short move body slide by one to get in position. So that means Cable has to be on eight power, which means he's not using his superpower throw. He's not using his telekinetic shield. Like, yeah. H- having having done the play where it's like, let's see if this works. It didn't work. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where I've had really great games with Cable, but he's so dicey. He, his plasma rifle... You, you always feel great when you get that incinerate, but I can't tell you how many times. So you roll those dice and you're like, nope, no incinerate, no incinerate, no incinerate, no incinerate. Whereas everybody how else is it, sitting there. How does it feel to just be like, how, how does it feel to just be like, hey, you have the same builder as Rocket Raccoon if you don't hit a wild and you're five threat? It, exactly. I mean, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. And, and so he's, he's, I, I could say D t- C tier because I do get some use out of him and, and you can splash him in different places to kind of help. But mm-hmm. but I'm not going to argue too hard with D tier because he's he, he needs a lot. He needs a lot to kind of come up. And that's not before we even talk about his affiliation leadership ability. Yeah, this is this is tier list is not for the leadership discussion stuff. That's a that's a whole other thing, especially after Shadowland Daredevils just kind of came into the scene and slapped him upside the face with uh, his own leadership. Yeah, but hey, he's immune to poison. So there is that. He is immune to poison. Uh, Next up is one that I think Cassandra is for the C tier. C C for C tier. Mm. Oh, so we're doing Cassandra Nova now. Yeah. She, she's yeah, no, next she's in super line. D. She's super D. And you, you're going to go ahead and throw her all the way down, even with the new Sentinel affiliation and uh, all that that's uh, on its way. Okay, we- so let's let's play that out, right? You play her with Sentinel Prime. That's 10, 10 threat you're committed <laughs> to there. Then you have two more four threats that you're going to want to put in there. So you your minimum have fun with Cassandra Nova playtime is like 18. Real, you could like do it you with could, fourteen. Like as I say, you could play fourteen, but you're not. You don't want to not play with the two giant robots, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, I don't disagree. Yeah, yeah. So like, cool. And what does the Sentinels prime? Like, what does Sentinel Prime and the Sentinels leadership and all of that stuff give to Cassandra that she didn't already have? It's power, right? Like Mutant Hunters gives her power, but only when people are dazed. Right. And Cassandra's biggest problem, her biggest problem is that she does not get the power she needs to do the cool stuff, Mm -hmm. honestly. So her psionic bolt, range four, five mystic with a wild sap. Like, that's 
better than Dr. Voodoo's range-wise, but for whatever reason, it doesn't translate into power like Voodoo translates into power because he gets the thing from the skulls, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that to me doesn't work. And then you've got to get into that close range for a mind possession, which is an incredibly strong attack. Six dice mystic for one power, and you just get to advance him. It's deception for one power on this character. Yeah. It's incredible, right? But again, you have to spend a power to use it. So if you use that instead of psionic bolt, you're not gaining any power back. And you probably don't actually want to daze the character that you're attacking with this, but on six dice, you potentially could. And again, think about her in that Sentinel's affiliation. Then she's going to get that power, and then she's just stood there, and hopefully, hopefully you have the power to do a psychic distraction with her. But again, that's kind of like cute. It's it's less less good than cute, I feel like. Mm-hmm. And all of this is like, okay, and she has two physical defense, which is the most popular thing in the game, and we have characters that have long-range physical attacks now, so good luck. She does she's have... She's got stealth. Functional Earth. stealth. Telepathic cloak. Right. But it, I'm, I'm telling you, in my experience, it doesn't help. I can so, see her in the C tier, but I want to hear your argument for C tier. Cool. So I look at her, and then I look at Ebony Maw, and then I look at the character that we're about to talk about next, and I'm like, man, I think the only thing she needs is one, maybe two power in the power phase, and then she's fine. Agree with that. And so I don't, I don't think it's this major we work where uh, we we have to go in and change defenses, superpowers, and attacks. Where I think that's kind of the case with Cable. I, I think she just needs just an extra power a turn, maybe two. Two might be a little bit too much, uh, but to give her access to some of her tools. And that'll bring her up into a place where she's a little bit more reasonably played. I I think that giving her an extra power is the, is definitely a change. I don't think she needs a complete rework, but Mm -hmm. I definitely feel like that, uh, you know, you compare her to Ebony Maw, right? Like Ebony Maw in his five threat state is already significantly more valuable than Cassandra Nova is. Mm Mm-hmm. Whereas Cassandra Nova, it's like, where are you going to put her that you wouldn't put Ebony Maw? Yeah, no, that's fair. And and so that's why I feel like if, if you look at Ebony Maw's kit, then she definitely needs a rework. And like in terms of defenses, as someone I've played her a lot in convocation, she only has the four mystic defense and she's supposed to be this mental powerhouse. How does Ebony Maw have a six mystic defense and she's only got a four and she's supposed to be the person that like brought down the freaking X-Men at one point. You know what I'm like? I don't know. So I have frustrations, Nate, and yep. she's my D tier for me. But I, if you want to keep her in the C, that's on you. It's understandable to keep her at C, but you, you want her in the D tier. You, you want a bigger rework. Cause I want to love her. Like, that's the thing. Like it's a character I want to love. Like I, when I read this kit, I'm like, this all this this resonates with me. This all sounds really good, and and I want to use it. Mm-hmm. And then I get in a game, and I can't use any of it. So I think she's on the lower end of C tier, like probably the the bottom of the C tier. Not not fully in the D tier, but she's got like a foot down in there, and she could easily slip, break a hip, and fall down into it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like her little her little. Uh, thing that she's shooting off of is firmly in the D tier, but she's luckily just enough elevated into that C tier. All right. Fair enough. We'll keep her, we'll keep her at the bottom side of it. Uh, <laughs> next up is her, her pack mate who I also feel is pretty strongly in the C tier. And that's uh, Jean gray. Completely agree. I'll, I'll put her just above her. Cause I really don't think Jean is in much of a better place than Cassandra Nova. Completely agree. I think Jean needs help. She's got an amazing spender, actually. Like, her spender's very, very good. Nine dice physical, six power costs a lot. But it's before damage is dealt, throwing size four, and then gets the explosive. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. All good things. 
that's about it. Like, it's again, I think it's, she gets that extra power, but all of her stuff is costed one extra power. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, well, she's going to get extra power, but you still got to like do the work to get her more power so that she can do the fun things. Yeah, make Psionic Bolt a, a six die builder that has sat power on it. Like, why these two did not get the same builder that Modok, who also then has rerolls, has? Tell me about it. I I don't understand. I, I don't understand that either. And and Jean's in an interesting place because when you think about a character and like the activation order, right? Like that matters at times, right? Jean's a character that wants to go last. And mm-hmm. that is a very contested field of characters, especially in these higher threats we go. Mm-hmm. Yep, because she has that control of the matter transmutation that can help control both your team and the opposing team. Man, uh, wouldn't that feel better at two power too? Just with yeah. the expenses of everywhere else in her kit. Yeah, uh, and and again, it's probably not even that. It's probably just that psionic bolt needs to be one step higher. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't she doesn't need a big change, but just enough of a change to where yeah, she's just that just that little bit. Yep. All right. And now I'm going to uh, I'm going to skip over the the person next so that we can talk about all three of the floaty mystic ladies in a row. And let's talk about Scarlet Witch. Yeah. Where do you want her? Because I am B minus C plus territory at the moment. Yeah, I'm I think she's a B. I think she's she's probably on the lower end of the B spectrum. Mhm. But man, I I've I've had a lot of experience into Scarlet Witch more so than with Scarlet Witch myself. Mhm. And and I my opinion is a little bit skewed because she's less good into wizards and that's what I play a lot these days. Mhm. But even into wizards, counting skulls and being able to throw all those conditions on there, I mean, she is a delete machine. Mm-hmm. And it, again, like it's it's just dicey. She's just dicey. But I feel like she's dicey with other things to mitigate poor dice, unlike Thor, who is dicey but can't really mitigate his poor dice, right? Like she's got the curse, right? So somebody can get the judgment condition, which is really nice. She's got a nice throw. And then she's got like the hex field. So you can't get rid of these conditions. Once you get them, she can hex people with chaos magic, which is amazing. Her spender's amazing. So like, I feel like she's just enough above Thor because of the little extras, but she's Mm -hmm. still, she's still just slightly on that lower edge of that B tier. Because yeah. she's gonna kill shit. Yeah. I at the end of the day, she is she is a, a fantastic killing machine. She's more durable than you think because basically she is half of what you expect out of counting blanks and successes. She has kind of like half of that just built into her kit with counting skulls as successes. The the only thing that makes me want to say C minus is man, I wish she had some mobility. Because she she wants to double tack. That's where you get the value out of her uh, later in the game. And if she gets pushed off of something, there are going to be few opportunities where you don't want her to double tap uh, instead of having to move her and then do an attack or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, her cruel twist costing six again really good attack but man costing six just kind of leaves her no power for anything else and she has other things that she wants to do she has two extremely good team tactic cards uh amongst other things so i i would not mind seeing like a reality warp range two place on her but that probably makes her a little bit too good realistically so good like like that's the thing like there's really not much i would change on her because i feel like she's She's just what she is, mm-hmm. and and maybe I don't know. Yeah, you know, I mean, like I wouldn't change much because I, I that, but that doesn't make her a B, though, or that doesn't make her an A. Yeah, 
but at the no, same it, time, it makes her a, a solid B. You you right, play her in A Force okay. where she can get fed some power. You play her with Brotherhood, she gets fed some power. Yeah. You play her on Avengers and she gets uh, mobility and the power discount that you want on telekinesis. Exactly. Not to mention being able to curse people for one feels nice. It sure does. And I will say with that, you know, it's okay for some characters, I feel like, to just be what they are in mm-hmm. the tier that they are. You know what I mean? Yeah. At the end of the day. I also just really like Scarlet Witch, so I would not mind bumping her up into the, the A tier by giving her more tools, but she doesn't need it. Uh, and talking about characters who don't need any help, uh, I've got only the one character who I think belongs in the S tier at five threat, and that is the Juggernaut. The Juggernaut. I think he is just a little bit too much. And what about so you? Weird. Do you think I'm out of line with... Uh, Throwing him up into the S tier? No. No. You, you sound reluctant about it, too. <laughs> yeah, because, like, Juggernaut, right? Like, the Juggernaut. Oh, yeah. And, and like, when, when I think about the character, thematically, right? Like, the character. And, and yeah, I mean, the character is an S tier type character in the comics. And what he does on the tabletop... I feel like is weirdly doesn't translate to how I think of him in my head. And so like, yeah, he, I mean on the tabletop though. Yeah. He's, he's gotta be S tier. Nothing stopped the juggernaut being able to use it over and over and over and over again is an amount of mobility that rivals amazing Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. If not more so even mm-hmm. because of that big base and everything. Yep. So it's, and yeah, I mean, I, I could see him like in comparison to other S tier characters that are in the three and the four, maybe even six threat range. He's probably on the lower end of an S tier character, but I still think he's he's pretty incredible. So. Yeah, I think him effectively being immune to stun and stagger helps uh, him a lot. And really, the only thing I would like to see is uh, nothing stops the juggernaut get made into a sliding cost in the same way where magnetos initially cost the same size as whatever he's throwing. And then the next throw he gets is the size plus one. And the next one is the size plus two. Uh, right. I would just like, that's the only thing I would like to see change on nothing stops the juggernaut. Well, it, it's interesting because if you put a sliding scale on there, you're, you're probably going to get it twice and then you're, you're going to want to use like I'm the juggernaut or something more often, maybe, but Mm -hmm. like, that's the thing. If you use, I'm the juggernaut, how does that affect? Nothing stops the juggernaut. You, I think you are able to just keep it the same. You get to get away with spending it. Nothing for it. If you get the wild on, on the juggernaut and it counts toward one of your uses, but you get a, so basically if you were having to spend four power anyway, it actually gives you a reason to do I'm the juggernaut. Otherwise I don't think that attack ever gets used. Yeah. It's very rarely used. So I could see that that's, it's interesting. And um, for me, it's one of those things where juggernaut just kind of breaks the pattern of the game that I'm used to. And it's weird. So like he has to move, then he gets to do an eight dice strike and then he gets whatever power off of that. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's unusual that something like nothing stops a juggernaut, like you can do nothing stops a juggernaut, then do two five dice strikes. But I don't see that ever being done that way. Usually it's do the move action, do the strike, then NSTJ all over the place. Mm -hmm. And, and he just, yeah, it's, it's just odd for me in, in this game and people love him so much, but I'm here looking at that and I'm like, but I want to punch things more and I only get to do it once per turn. But it's one big punch. Yeah, but it all it for every time I roll it, it's pretty <laughs> pillow fisted. That's fair. Uh, I personally like how they have designed him. I think that nothing's off the juggernaut just needs a slight tuning, uh, and maybe his extra card that lets him throw somebody long maybe gets changed to medium because oh, yes, the, so good. the throwing long is uh, is busted levels of good. Uh, but outside of that, I think, uh, Juggernaut's really close to being in just like a perfect place, but as it is right now, I think he is, uh, a little, little too universal 
and a little too strong for what he brings, especially since earlier in the game, he's immune to most forms of control. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. It's fair. He, I'm not trying to dissuade you from putting him in S. I think oh, yeah, he's in no. S. You're good. Uh, next up is Dr. Strange SS. Speaking of who I do not think belongs in the S tier. I'm not even sure about A, but I'm pretty confident in B. But you, as the person who has played him on repeat for the last uh, year and a half, I'm curious on your thoughts. Uh, well, look, my heart says <laughs> he's obviously the Sorcerer Supreme. Therefore, he's the S. He's got three S's in his name. Come on. It's a lot of S's. So, anyways, no, he's probably not S tier, but he is... <sighs> He's eight. Mm, 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 no. Right. I hate this because <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, all right, I'll give the argument for why he's awesome. And you tell me after this, where he belongs. You hit me. So he has the single best control superpower in the game. Period. Full stop. In scalpel of strange. It costs a lot. It's four power. He has no problem getting to four power. But he can place any character, and they can only be affected by it once per turn, place them within range three. So he's got to be within two of them, and then they're placed range three. It is incredible. It is a great, 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 great superpower. It's his only superpower, though. But then he's got a... Five dice mystic attack that's range three with a wild pierce. He's got a range five attack that can be any flavor. And the extra part doesn't matter, but it's range five, six dice. And it can be any type of attack you want it to be. And then, again, think about the fact that he can scalpel of strange himself and his opponents, depending on how the dice go and stuff like that. So he can play at ranges, play with his mobility. He's on that 50 millimeter base. He's incredibly mobile. And then if you play him in the right affiliation, looking at you, Convocation, he gets turned up to where he functions almost like a six threat. Mm -hmm. So I think people should play him more out of affiliation. They don't. But in terms of, of like changes and stuff, I would literally only make one change to him. And it's one that he probably doesn't need, but I would do it anyways. And that's, I would, I would give him a four energy defense to match match OG Strange. That's fair. And I, I think that they didn't give him that four simply because the Mystic Armor of Strange is a very strong innate superpower. But, 100%. But like literally, if he had that, he he would be the primo of primo Dr. Strangeos. And I don't know. I, I He's not an S tier, honestly. Yeah, but I, no. Definitely not. I want, you know, but I feel like that if he was played out of affiliation more, you have to protect him a little more because he definitely like the three, three, five, you're going to see a lot of physicals. So you have to play around the fact that you're going to get hit with physicals and you don't have something like Ironbound books to protect you. But he, he's really strong and don't sleep on strange Supreme in Avengers. Like, yeah, everybody's good in Avengers, but seriously, He's really good in Avengers getting a scalpel of strange turn one for three power. I, like he's better than OG. And I just, I love him. I know you do. I can hear it. We can all hear it. The passion, everything else. <laughs> uh, and look, yeah. I've lived the dream. I've lived the dream. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Nate. I've lived the dream where, where you get, three scalpel of strangers in one turn. Now, if you did the math quickly at home, that's 12 power and being able to do that three times in one turn, it'll get you jacked. <laughs> yeah. Being able to get the, the free additional two power every single go is uh, really nice. Uh, there's a lot of things to love. I don't think he is splashable enough to call an A, but I think he's the best B of the characters that we've thrown into the B tier. Yeah, I think you could make an argument with him and Modok, but they play different games, but similar. They're both damage dealing. They both have control, all of that stuff. But like, yeah, I'd, I, pre I prefer Strange just because he has the extra mobility 
exactly. with the scalpel for himself as well as uh, buddies. That's exactly it. Like you, strange will chase him down. Yep. yep and yep. seriously, in convocation, I'm just gonna one more thing. If you're playing into somebody who's playing Doctor Strange in convocation, and you have a physical attack, and the Ironbound books is in play, just just don't do it. Just just attack somebody else because you're gonna be sad. <laughs> Yeah, Mystic Armor of Strange is uh, real good and real annoying. <sighs> All right, we've only got three left. Uh, two of them aren't even actually out yet, so I don't know how we're going <laughs> to attempt to rank them. Uh, but we've got Power Gem Black Swan, who I think is on next to Sorcerer Supreme Strange as like really high B, maybe an A, because she is pretty splashable and very effective as a splash yeah uh that's that's my girl i love black swan and the only problem that black swan has so her midnight field is very similar to modok's defensive ability canceling wilds all of that fun stuff and Mm -hmm. she she will murder anything but boy does she love spending her power well that's why you throw the power gem on her yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. You put the power gem on her, and that opens up a turn one charge I beam, and then you're sitting there with no power unless you got to range two to then do a strike. Mm-hmm. So then, if you activated her and she gets a little attacked into, you have no power for midnight field, and you're just betting on the dice at that point. And in my experience with her, because everyone knows at this point that she makes everything die. It's like, we'll just go hard into Black Swan, and if you are careless, like I have been at times, to not save power on her with Midnight Field, you're going to feel it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty great. But she, she is designed to murder stuff real good, and I think that outside of Corvus, she's one of the best at it. Yeah, she's really good, has uh, Goblin's leadership uh, as a one-cost uh, power, which is really nice. Charge, everything dies, uh, the the triggers are not always going to be hit, but you at least usually get the follow-up, which is going to incinerate somebody. Uh, not to mention that that I-beam has a chance to pierce. Uh, lots and lots to love on her card, and at five power, I think she is absolutely splashable. Uh, and if you're looking for a, a five threat mobile beater, she is the the go to at this point, I think. Yeah, but don't leave her out there. I'm telling you, don't do not overextend her if you can help it. You better make sure that everything dies. I'm just saying. Yep. Uh, next up, we have probably the guy that's coming for her job, but I'm not sure he's there yet. And that is Red Skull Master of Hydra, who I think preemptively I'm going to throw in B tier. Because I I have durability worries for him, even more so than what Black Swan has with problems, because he's got the Leviathan armor, but that means he's going to have a two defense somewhere, and even then his uh, physical will always be four. Yeah, I I think that's fair. I think a high B tier, kind of not really knowing, but definitely a high B tier, because I feel like he's really going to punch hard. Like empowered gauntlets, blitz strike is going to really, really take some people off guard. I think, mm-hmm. and and it's one of those things where it's uh, yeah, it's just it's it's gonna be good. I think he's gonna be solid, but yeah, durability is gonna be a problem. But you still got a ton of stamina to chew through. Seven and six, that's still pretty good. And not it's pretty to mention, good. He's, he's gonna hurt himself. Grunts. Yeah, he is. Uh, he is also bringing his own grunts, which is. Uh, a significant thing that does not need to be left. It kind of lets him move forward doing his own thing while you don't necessarily feel bad if he doesn't end up on a secure because his uh, Hydra goons are taking care of that job for him. Exactly. And and I feel like you can't talk about what his value on the tabletop is going to be without thinking about the grunts. So, Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Uh, The, the only issues I have and granted, this is the same as uh, Black Swan, which is why I think they're very similar, is all of his control is tied to die results. You yeah. have to hit those things. 
Uh, he won't have power problems, but because he can generate that two power at the cost of damaging himself, but that kind of loops back into the uh, durability issues and stuff like that. So I don't know. Need to need to get him on the table to see if he bumps himself up to A, but I think he is very firmly uh, B, B plus. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, and next up, we have literally the largest model that AMG has uh, released so far, at least, with the Sentinel Prime. A tier. A tier, really? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I was going to have him as a, a pretty firm B as somebody who has not either played against nor with him at this point. But uh, tell me about this A tier Sentinel. So I've played a few proxy games with Sentinels because I that's going to be my next obsession. Mm-hmm. And Sentinel Prime is this why you're so down on Cassandra Nova as a as a quick aside? A little bit. Okay. A little bit. I mean, <laughs> man, I've played I've played Cassandra in a lot of places, and man, it's just, all right, we can't go down that road again. No, Sentinel Prime is really great in a lot of ways, and one of the things that I find interesting and how he plays and what he brings to a squad, it's really all kind of tied to that pattern analysis superpower, and he has no problem getting power, and you don't really have to worry about when you activate him versus when you activate other characters around him, and I think that that is why he becomes very splashable for me, is that I can activate a Sentinel Prime early. I can go mm-hmm. stand him on a secure, he's going to be able to take some punishment, and He's going to sit there and my opponents pretty much can't move him pretty much more or less. And then, you know, he's got the ability to gain his power. So the power matrix after standing on that secure. So then he can use pattern analysis on himself when he's getting attacked or on the friends that maybe are better at dealing the damage than he is. So Mm -hmm. I really like that as well. Then flip it on to as the game goes along and he's gaining this power plasma blast becomes incredible as you get to add up to three dice you're rolling what juggernaut can only do once you can potentially do it twice to be fair you are spending uh six power if you're doing it twice but yes yeah and it's and you should have the power to do it most of the time and so it's i i feel like that also again that the level of helping out characters like thor like some of these other characters that we talked about being really dicey with pattern analysis, it's range four around that massive base. That's mm-hmm. a lot of distance that he's affecting in the game. And I really like that as well. So, and, and then again, you can't discount the fact that he's got 18 stamina that you have to chew through. Yeah. He is a, he is a tanky boy for that fact alone. Uh, I love the way his kit was designed with the power matrix plus the pattern analysis. So like even if he's not doing anything on his turn, the first turn, he's still making a, a giant impact on the board uh, everywhere else, basically. Exactly. So that that's why I feel like he's probably on the lower end of an A tier, but still definitely an A tier because I feel like you can splash him into places and he's going to provide a value even at five threat. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. I mean, he's got control on uh, any size. He's got something that will become a a really nasty builder as the game goes on, a really nasty spender, especially if you start hitting those wilds, because all of those conditions are super relevant. Uh, Oh, yeah. And the the thing that I probably like most about him over the four threat, just normal Mark IV Sentinels, is his injured side uh, is all still good things, where the normal Sentinels get like hamstrung pretty bad. Yeah. Once they uh, they lose their plasma blast and a couple other things, so excited to see what uh, the 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 five threat giant is able to to do. Absolutely, cool. And that wraps up everybody at this point. Uh, only one S tier to one D tier, which I feel like is a, a pretty good ratio, and also just kind of shows that like outside of some minor tweaks that we would like to see. AMG has done a really nice job of uh, kind of balancing the scales, at least in me and Will's opinion. Yeah, I mean, I could say that there's two D tiers, but we digress. (laughs) (laughs) 
I, I think it's a, a minor enough change. I think that there are a plethora of those like tiny tweaks that uh, AMG could make and be great for the, the game state, but time will tell if they ever actually uh, do that a second time. I hope they do, mostly because a lot of these characters have not had their cards printed in the new way, and I would really like for all of the character cards to be the same style. But that's me and, I don't know, probably quite a few other hundreds of people who feel like that. Dozens and dozens of people. Dozens and dozens. Listen to us. Uh, But that is all we have for you guys today. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. And then next week we will be covering the six plus threats because there really aren't that many sixes and there are really be awkward to just do like a seven plus since there's all of three characters so and that will conclude the uh the tier list for this year and probably for at least another year so uh, thank you all for listening and until next time keep on gaming yeah Woohoo. that was fun <laughs>